Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. So today is New Book Teardown Day. The book we'll be looking at is the third edition of Electrical Engineering 101. Everything you should have learned in school, but probably didn't, by Darren Ashby. So I thought um, uh, that uh, for a new book review, um, or a new book teardown, um, when, when we start, the first thing we'll do is we'll go and look, look for the book on Amazon, and we'll get an idea of what, what it's selling for, what people are saying about it, what else the author's done, how much it costs, what format it's available in, and that sort of thing. So um, let's jump over to the computer and do that, and then once we finish with that, we'll pop you over to the bench and we'll have a look at this thing, see what's inside it. Here we are on the computer. So uh, let's uh, go over to Amazon. Uh, now, the name of the book is Electrical Engineering 101 by Darren Ashby. This is the third edition, that's what we want. Looks like there's some of the older editions here as well. Is that the second edition? I believe it is. So uh, this one, uh, the first edition, 2005, second edition, 2009, and the uh, third edition, uh, 2011, which is <clears throat> about 13 years ago. <sighs> now, Let's see what it has to say. So the title is The Electri Electrical Engineering 101, Everything You Should Have Learned in School But Probably Didn't, 3rd Edition by Darren Ashby, 386 ratings with uh, an average rating or a total rating or aggregate rating of 4.4 stars. Um, so uh, it's available in Kindle format and in paperback format. So it looks like with the paperback you can buy it new for $34.95 or there are um, used options. You can get one here for $16.46 and on the Kindle you can either uh, buy or rent uh, and, and the date that you rent it to affects the price that you pay. So you can get the Kindle for nineteen twenty two, or you can rent it for a couple of days. That's through the uh, ten slash twenty one. That's quite a while, isn't it? Because we're in July now, so that's August, September, October. You rent it for three months and pay for uh, <coughs> about two thirds the price. All right. Now let's read the blurb. It says. Electrical Engineering 101 covers the basic theory and practice of electronics, starting by answering the question, what is electricity? It goes on to explain the fundamental principles and components, relating them constantly to real-world examples. Uh, selections on tools and troubleshooting give engineers deeper understanding and the know-how to create and maintain their own electronic design projects. Unlike other books that simply describe electronics and provide step-by-step -step build instructions, EE 101 <coughs> delves into how and why electricity and electronics works, giving the reader the tools to take their electronics education to the next level. It is written in a down-to-earth style and explains jargon, technical terms, and schematics as they arise. The author builds a genuine understanding of the fundamentals and shows how they can be applied to a range of engineering problems. This third edition includes more real-world examples and a glossary of formulae. It contains new coverage of microcontrollers, FPGAs, classes of components, memory, RAM, ROM, etc., surface mount, high-speed design, board layout, advanced digital electronics, e.g. processors, transistor circuits and circuit design, op-amp and logic circuits, use of test equipment, Gives readers a simple explanation of complex concepts in terms they can understand and relate to everyday life. Updated content throughout and new material on the latest technological advances. Provides readers with an invaluable set of tools and references that they can use in their everyday work. There you go. And customers who bought this also bought uh, Electrical Engineering Without Prior no Knowledge. I don't know if I've got that one. Do I have that one already? I'm not sure. 
um, and uh, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics. We've already covered that one on this channel. The Art of Electronics, we've covered that as well. Encyclopedia of Electronic Components, I have that on my shelf, so we'll be covering that one day. Uh, a degree in a book, Electrical and Mathematical Engineering, that sounds pretty interesting. And Circuit Analysis for Dummies, seriously? No one who does circuit analysis is a dummy. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's have a look. So, uh, editorial reviews, reviews from Amazon.com reviews. So this is various things people have said about the book. This is a great book because the author is taking basic theory and providing the reader <coughs> with some good intuitive tools to gain a foothold on how components work. Many textbook authors in the circuit analysis arena or electrical engineering is a broader area. <coughs> tend to do one of three things. A, over explain a concept until the reader loses track of what he's doing. B, skipping too many steps in showing the derivation of a formula or the solving of a problem. Or C, place more emphasis on the mathematics associated with specific problem rather than the problem's significance. The author clearly develops, avoids these traps. Okay, so they've got various nice things to say about the author. Um, and let's have a look and see if he's written anything else. All right, so he's he's got a book out, uh, Circuit Design Know It All. What's this time of death? That's a bit odd. Electronics Starter Pack. It's a CD-ROM currently unavailable. And Circuit Design Know It All. Let's go and have a look at this. What's this all about? Uh, the new, the newness know-it-all, newness know-it-all series takes the best of what our authors have written to create a hard-working desk reference that will be an engineer's first port of call for key information, design techniques, and rules of thumb, guaranteed not to gather dust on a shelf. Electronic, electronics engineers need to master a wide area of topics to excel. The circuit design know-it-all covers every single in uh, every angle, including semiconductors, IC design, and fabrication, computer-aided design, as well as programmable logic design. A 360-degree view from our best-selling authors. Topics include fundamentals, analog, linear, and digital circuits. The ultimate hard-working desk reference. All the essential information, techniques, and tricks of the trade in one volume. All right. So, I'm going to put these away for later. I'm going to keep that one. And let's see what the other ones were just quickly. Uh, electrical engineering without prior knowledge. Understand the basics within seven days. Huh. I don't know. Still, it's got a pretty good rating. 364 ratings, 4.4 stars. We'll come and we'll check it out another day. I uh, I don't have a lot of new books. I've got heaps and heaps of old books for doing the old book reviews, but I kind of keeping my eye out for uh, uh, for for other uh, new books that that I might add to my library. So I'll just keep these notes. Now I don't like buying for dummies books because I don't feel like I'm a dummy, even when I don't know something yet. Still. Circuit Analysis for Dummies, first edition, Kindle edition. Uh, circuits overloaded from electric circuit analysis. Many universities require that students pursuing a degree in electrical or computer in engineering take an electric circuit analysis course to determine who will make the cut and continue in the degree program. Circuit Analysis for Dummies will help these students to better understand electric circle analysis by presenting the information in an effective and straightforward manner. Hmm. All right. Well, I've made some notes for uh, for later. We won't spend any more time uh, on that in this video. So I'll pop you over to the bench and uh, let's have a look <clears throat> at the book. Here we are on the bench. This is our book. Uh, third edition. Uh, electrical engineering. What's happening with all these lights? Yeah. Um, 
third edition, electrical engineering, everything you should have learned in school but probably didn't. Uh, includes newness. Oh, oh, there we go. So newness is the um, is the publisher. There you go. This includes an online membership. There you go. Uh, if you enjoyed this book, please post a review to your favorite online bookstore today. Okay. And Newness is an imprint of Elsevier. I don't know how you pronounce that. Newnesspress.com. There we go. So what does it say on the back? Uh, it says it's categorized in uh, electronics slash engineering. Um, uh, understand the how and why of electronics. Whether you're straight out of school or just need a refresher, this book will explain the theory and give you the practical tools, including people skills, to succeed in the world of electrical engineering. Electrical Engineering 101 covers the basics, theory and practice of electronics. Starting by answering the question, what is electricity? It goes on to explain the fundamental principles and components, relating them constantly to real world examples. Sections on tools and troubleshooting give engineers deeper understanding and the know-how to create and maintain their own electronic design projects. Unlike other books that simply describe electronics and provide step-by-step -step build instructions, Electrical Engineering 101 delves into how and why electricity and electronics work, giving the reader intuitive understanding and the tools to take their electronics education to the next level. Darren Ashby builds a genuine understanding of the fundamentals and shows how they can be applied to a range of engineering problems. The, this third edition includes more real-world examples and a glossary of formulae, in, along with new coverage of microcontrollers, classes of components, memory, RAM, ROM, etc., surface mount, board layout, advanced digital electronics, for example, processors, transistor circuits and circuit design, op-amp and logic circuits, use of test equipment. There you have it. So, title page. Is that it? Yeah, okay. How are we going? Can you see everything there? Now, Electrical Engineering 101, third edition, published everywhere Amsterdam, Boston, Heidelberg, London, New York, Oxford, Paris, San Diego, San Francisco, Singapore, Sydney, and Tokyo. We got Sydney in there, baby. All right. Newness is an imprint of El Sevier. Sevier? I don't know. Um, uh, MA, is that Massachusetts? Maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, in Waltham. Waltham. Uh, and in Oxford in the UK. There we go. Published 2012. Uh, there you go. <coughs> So, uh, here's the table of contents. We'll be going through that shortly. The preface, we'll have a look at the preface. We'll read about the author, why not? And then what is electricity really? I think we want to read that bit, don't we? And then eventually we'll get up to the... Uh, oh, this was printed in Australia by Griffin Press. Oh, there you go. And uh, at the back of the book, what have we got? Got a bit of an index here. Have we got any appendices? I suppose we'll find out when we have a look in the table of contents. Ah, glossary, very good. We'll have a look at that. Ripper. And what about oh, an appendix? No. Ah, oh, touchy feely stuff. They're going to talk about people skills. Well, that that's that's it. We'll have a look at that. So we'll have a look at the what is electricity, and we'll have a look at the touchy feely stuff. That sounds like good fun. Can't have too much touchy feely stuff. So before we read the um, the preface and about the author, um, let's have a look at the contents of the book. So um, <laughs> chapter zero: What is electricity really? Chicken versus egg. So what is electricity? The atom. Now what? A preview of things to come. It just seems magical. Then there's chapter one. Three things they should have taught in Engineering 101. Units count. How to visualize electrical components. Learn an intuitive approach. Lego engineering. Chapter two, basic theory. 
Ohm's law still works. Constantly drill the fundamentals. It's about time. Beam me up. Keep it under control. Chapter 3. Pieces parts. Partially conducting electricity. Uh, power and heat management. The magical mysterious op amp. Negative feedback. Positive feedback. It's supposed to be logical. Microprocessor microcontroller basics. Climbing the software language mountain. Input and output. Chapter 4. The real world. Bridging the gap. A to D and back again. It takes a little D to A to get a little A to D. <clears throat> when parts aren't perfect. Robust design. Some of my favorite circuits. Get your own. Here are a few. Power supplies. Making stuff move. The electromechanical world. Maintaining speed. Some other types of motors. Chapter 5. Tools. Making the invisible visible. Simulators. Soldering irons. People tools. Chapter 6. Troubleshooting. Getting ready for the hunt. Ghost in the, mark, in the machine. EMI. Timing is everything. Under pressure. Be prepared for surprises. Code junkies beware. Chapter 7. Touchy feely stuff. People skills. Becoming an extroverted introvert. Communication skills. Especially for managers. Especially for employees. How to make a great product. Glossary, page 261. Index, page 269. So it's got roughly 250 pages in it, this book. So it's uh, it's quite readable. Not, not too big. Uh, and this is the preface. Let's see what the author has to say in the preface. The first word. In my day job, I have been lucky enough to work with one of the greatest corporate success stories in the technical field ever. For a sparky tech nut just <coughs> going to the Google campus was a bit like traipsing to Mecca. I remember my first tour there and getting a free lunch. Our corporate contact <coughs> made a comment. He said, they've created some kind of engineer's paradise over here. I kind of wondered about that comment. Over the last couple of years, I have uh, pondered it quite a bit. I learned a lot more about what this paradise was <coughs> was in subsequent dealings with the king of search. They had the free food and all these other perks, but the thing that stood out most to me from the first time I heard, I heard it was 20% time. A quick Google search will tell you the details of 20% time. The principle is simple. You are given 20% of your time to work on a pet project. Uh, the project is your choice. The only caveat is that if you come up with something cool, Google gets to use it to make more money. In talking to contacts there, I found out that time is sacrosanct. Your manager cannot demand you give up that time for your main goals. You can volunteer it if you want to, but it is up to you. In general, in general planning, however, you and your boss plan four days a week on your main assigned tasks, and one day every week is yours. Okay. <coughs> uh, build intrapreneurs. I learned a new term recently that I think is very relevant in corporate growth and success, intrapreneur. The intrapreneur is the baby brother to the entrepreneur. Uh, this is the guy who has that big idea and wants change in the world. He has the mentality to do so, but doesn't have the resources. Resources, in fact, is the only way in which they differ. The entrepreneur finds a way to resource his idea, but whether due to motivation or circumstance, the entrepreneur can't quite get over that issue. Oftentimes, these are the shooting stars in your organization. The trick is to enable these guys to make things happen. Give them the resources and turn them loose. The 20% time mentioned above is a great way of finding these individuals. The successful entrepreneur will gather others and use their 20% time to make something cool. What engineer do you know that wouldn't consider that paradise? Engineers equals success. 
Why are engineers so important to America's success? Here is an interesting fact or two. Google hires 50% engineers and 50% 50, 50 everyone else. Twice as many startup businesses are from new MIT grads than from Harvard Business School grads. And the schools are practically right next to each other. I haven't met an engineer who doesn't, <coughs> who doesn't like to make cool things. It is in their mindset. It is in their nature. Great engineers usually make pretty good money relative to the average Joe in America simply because their skill set is so valued. Thing is, they aren't always the top paid people even though their contributions are often much more critical to success than that of all the management above them. I think this is uh, because they get so much satisfaction out of making stuff that as long as they feel like they are making ends meet, things are good. This type of person is a huge asset to the American economy. Greed doesn't drive them, invention does, and invention leads to an improved economy more than anything else. Invention of new technology improves the standard of living for everyone. It is the only thing that does. Google went from nothing to the top in 11 years. They themselves credit this to hiring great engineers and cutting them loose to change the world. We need more of this. We, we humans have a built-in engineering gene. We love to build and make stuff. Every kid plays with blocks, creates things and imagines things. So why aren't there more engineers? Is it really that hard to become one? Should it be? I hope that someone out there reads this book and thinks, screw all those guys who think I'm not smart enough. I'm going to change the world anyway. Overview for engineers. Granted, there are many good teachers out there and you might have gotten the basics, but time and too many status reports have dulled the finish on your basic knowledge set. If you are like me, you have found a few really good books that you often pull off the shelf in times of need. They usually have a well-written, easy to understand explanation of the particular topic you need to apply. I hope this will be one of those books for you. You might also be a fish out of water, an ME thrown into the world of electrical engineering, an ME would be a mechanical engineer, uh, <coughs> who uh, would really like a basic understanding uh, to work with the EEs around you, and of course the EEs are the electrical engineers. Uh, if you get a really good understanding of these principles, I guarantee you will surprise at least some of the sparkies as I like to call them, with your intuitive insights into the problems at hand. For students, actually, you know, I was down at the, um, at the uh, Electronics, Aussie Electronics Expo just a couple of weeks ago, and there was a couple of kids there. They were young. They were 18, 19 years old, um, and they were with the Navy. And I called them Sparkies, and they said, oh, no, we're not smart. We're not Sparkies. We're electrical engineers. So in the Navy, Sparky, just is, it's, a, it's a term that's reserved for the, the guys who do mains voltage or high power stuff. People who are just doing, you know, 9 volt DC sort of stuff or radio stuff, they're not called Sparkies in the, in the Navy, in the Australian Navy. There you go. For students, <clears throat> I don't mean to knock the collegiate educational system, but it seems to me that <clears throat> uh, too often we can pass a class in school with the assimilate and regurgitate method. You know what I mean. Go to class, soak up all the things the teacher wants you to know, take the test, say the right things at the right time, and leave the class without an ounce of applicable knowledge. I think many students are forced into this mode when teachers do not take the time to lay the groundwork for the subject they are covering. Students are so hard pressed to simply keep up that they do not feel the light bulb go on over their heads or say, aha, now I get it. The reality is if you leave uh, the class with the fundamental understanding of the topic and you know the topic by heart, you will be eminently more successful at applying that basic knowledge than anything from the end of the syllabus for that class. For managers, the job of the engineering manager, and he's got a footnote here, it says, suggested alternate title for this book uh, from reader Travis Hayes, EE for dummies and those they manage. I liked it, but I figured the pointy hair types wouldn't get it. All right. 
the job of the engineering manager really should have more to it than is depicted by the pointy-haired boss you see in Dilbert cartoons. One thing many managers do not know about engineers is that they welcome truly insightful takes on whatever they might be working on. Please notice I said truly insightful. You can't just spout off some acronym you heard at the lunchroom and expect engineers to pay attention. However, if you understand these basics, I'm sure there will be times when you will be able to point your engineers in the right direction. You will be happy to keep the project moving forward and they will gain a new respect for their boss. They might even put away their pointy haired doll. <laughs> for teachers, Please don't get me wrong, I don't mean to say that all teachers are bad. In fact, most of my teachers, barring one or two, were really good instructors. However, sometimes I think the system is flawed. Given pressures from the Dean to cover X, Y and Z topics, sometimes the more fundamental X, X and Y are sacrificed just to get to the topic Z. I did get a chance to teach a semester at my own alma mater. Uh, some of these uh, chapters are directly from that class. My hope for teachers is to give you another tool that you can use to flip the switch on the aha light bulbs over your students' heads. For everyone, at the end of each topic discussed in this book are bullet points I like to call thumb rules. <coughs> uh, they are what they seem, those rule of thumb concepts that that really good engineers seem to just know. These concepts are, are what always led them to the right conclusions and solutions to problems. If you get bored with a section, make sure to hit the thumb rules anyway. There you will get the distilled core concepts that you really should know. Okay, I have to say those thumb, thumb rules sound kind of interesting. I wonder if we should have a look at them as well. Anyway, let's read about the author. Darren Coy Ashby is a self-described techno geek with pointy hair. He considers himself a jack of all trades, master of none. He figures uh, his common sense came from his dad and his book sense from his mother. Raised on a farm and graduated from Utah State University seemingly ages ago, <coughs> Darren has more than 20 years of experience in the real world as a technician, an engineer, and a manager. He has worked in diverse areas of compliance, production, testing, and his personal favorite, research and development. Darren jumped at a chance some years back to teach a couple of semesters <coughs> at his alma mater. Uh, for about two years, he wrote regularly for the online magazine chipcenter.com. He is currently uh, the director of electronics and R&D at a billion dollar consumer products company. Uh, his passions are boats, snowmobiles, motorcycles, and pretty much anything with a motor. When not at his day job, he spends most of his time with his family and a promising R&D consulting manufacturing firm he started a couple of years ago. Darren lives with his beautiful wife, four strapping boys, and a cute little daughter next to the mountains in Richmond, Utah. He believes pyromania goes hand in hand with becoming a great engineer and has dedicated a Facebook page to that topic. You can email him with comments, complaints and general ruminations at dashby at rad.com. If all you want are tidbits of wisdom, you can follow him on Twitter under Sparky Guru. All right. Look, I thought I might make a note about that domain name. We'll I'll put that in the show notes. Give me a pen here. All right. So, actually, I don't want pen. Where's my pencil? Here's my pencil. Oh. All right. And today's date, I believe, is the 23rd. I'm not sure. That'll do. Uh, and we want to check out, what was that dot com? Chipcenter.com. What was it? Uh, chip center.com and what are we reading it's just uh, put a bookmark in there okay uh, electrical engineering 101 3ed all right so we can make any other notes if we need to as we go uh, go along so let's read chapter zero 
and then we'll have a bit of a squeeze at the last chapter as well. Um, so, what is electricity really? Chicken versus egg. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I was faced with just such a quandary when I set, <coughs> set down to create the original edition of this book. The way I found... <coughs> The, uh, the way that I found people got the most out of the topics was to get some basic ideas and concepts down first. However, those ideas were built on a presumption of certain amount of knowledge. On the other hand, I realized that the knowledge <coughs> that was to be presented would make more sense if you first understood these concepts. Thus my chicken and egg dilemma. Suffice it to say that I jumped ahead to explaining the chicken the chicken being all about using electricity to our benefit. I was essentially assuming that the reader knew that the egg w that <laughs> knew what an egg was, the egg being a grasp on what electricity is. Truth be told, it was a bit of a cheat on my part. He's got a footnote here. Uh, do we all make compromises in the face of impossible deadlines? Are the deadlines only impossible because of our own procrastination? Those are both very heavy-duty questions, not unlike that of the chicken versus egg debate. Okay. So I, I lost my place there. Okay. Truth be told, it was a bit of a cheat on my part, and on top of that, I never expected the book to be such a runaway success. Turns out there are lots of people out there who want to know more about the magic of this ever-growing electronic world around us. So, for this new and improved edition of the book, I will digress and do my best to explain the egg. Skip ahead if you have uh, an idea of what it's all about. There's another footnote here, he says, thus the whole chapter zero idea. You can argue that zero or one is the right number to start counting with, so pick whichever chapter you want to begin with of these two and have at it. Mm. Um, or maybe stick around to see if this is an enlightening book, <coughs> enlightening look at what electro electricity really is. So what is electricity? The electron, what is it? Well, we haven't ever seen one. But we have found ways to measure a bunch of them. Meters, oscilloscopes, and all sorts of detectors tell us how electrons move and what they do. We have also found ways to make <coughs> them turn motors, uh, light up bulbs, power cell phones, computers, and thousands of other really cool things. The impact on our society is immeasurable. It goes to the very core. It, we even use the symbol of a light bulb turning on as an analogy to having a great idea. Not bad for something that only became part of the world at large a little over a hundred years ago. Ironically, it is this very light bulb I hope to metaphorically turn on for the readers of this book. What is electricity though? Actually, that is a very good question. If you dig deep enough, you can find RSPS. RSPs? RSP, a really smart person. RSP. As you will soon learn, I do hope to get an acronym or two into everyday vernacular for the common engineer. By the way, I believe that many engineers are RSPs. It seems to be a common trait among people of that profession. Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, if you dig deep enough, you will find really smart people all over the world who debate this very topic. I have no desire to, <coughs> to, uh, to that join that debate. There's a typo there. I have no desire to join that debate, having not attained RSP status yet. So I will tell you the way I see it and think about it so that it makes sense in my head. Since I'm just a hick from a small town, I hope that my explanation will make it easier for you to understand as well. The atom. We need to begin by learning about a very small particle that is referred to as an atom. A simple representation of one is shown in figure 0 0.1. And this is it here. Okay, a very basic symbol of an atom. Hmm. Atoms, and there's another footnote here. Uh, the atom is really, really small. We can sort of see an atom these days with some pretty cool instruments, but it is kind of like the way a blind person sees Braille by feeling it. 
Okay, atoms are made up of three types of particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Only two of these particles have a feature that we call charge. The proton carries a positive charge and the electrons carry a negative charge, whereas the neutron carries no charge at all. The individual protons and neutrons are much more massive than the wee little electron. Although they aren't the same size, the proton and the electron do carry equal amounts of opposite charge. Now, don't let the simple circuits of my diagram lead you to believe that this is the path uh, that electrons move in. They actually scoot around in a more energetic 3D motion that physicists refer to as a shell. There are many types and shapes of shells, but the specifics are beyond the scope of this text. You do need to understand that when you dump enough energy into an atom, you can get an electron to pop off and move fancy free. When this happens, the rest of the, at the atom has a net positive charge. There's a footnote here. Um, an atom with a net charge is also known as an ion. Okay. Um, when this happens, the rest of the atom has a net positive charge and the electron a net negative charge. Uh, as a footnote, uh, often referred to as a free electron. Actually, they have these charges when they are part of the atom. They simply cancel each other out so that when you look at the atom as a whole, the net charge is zero. Now, atoms don't like having electrons missing from their shells, so as soon as another one comes along, it will slip into the open slot in that atom shell. Uh, the amount of energy or work it takes to pop one of these electrons loose depends on the type of atom we're dealing with. When the atom is a good insulator, such as rubber, these electrons are stuck and hard in their shells. They aren't moving for anything. Take a look at the sketch in figure 0 0.2. There's figure 0 0.2, which says electrons are stuck in these shells as an insulator. They can't really leave and move fancy free. And then he's got uh, figure 0 0.3 and electron C. Mm. Okay. Uh, in an insulator, uh, these electron charges are stuck in place, orbiting the nucleus of the atom, similar to water frozen in a pipe. <coughs> I'm not going to keep reading the footnotes. There's too many of them. Uh, do take note that there are just as many positive charges as there are negative charges. With a good conductor though, such as copper, the electrons in the outer shells of the atom will pop off at the slightest touch. In metal elements, these electrons bounce around from atom to atom so easily that if we refer to them as an, that we refer to them as an electron C, or you might hear them referred to as free electrons. More visuals of this idea are shown in Figure 0.3. <sighs> Frankly, I don't understand really the difference between the hisses just put angle brackets around the negative ones, it seems. Anyway, but sure, there's an electron C, they're free electrons. Okay, um, you should note that there are still just as many positive charges as there are negative charges. The difference is uh, not the number of charges, it is the fact that they can move easily. This time they are like water in the pipe uh, that isn't frozen but liquid albeit a pipe that is already full of water, so to speak. Getting the electrons to move just requires a little push and away they go. <clears throat> One effect of all these loose electrons is the silvery shiny appearance that metals have. No wonder <clears throat> the element that we call silver is one of the best conductors there is. One more thing, a very fundamental property of charge is that the charges repel Sorry, is that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. If you bring a free electron next to another free electron, they will tend to push the other electron away from it. Getting the positively charged, positively charged atoms to move is much more difficult. They are stuck in place virtually... <coughs> uh, they, stu uh, they are stuck in place in virtually all solid materials. But the same thing applies to positive charges as well. All right. Uh, I'm going to just take a quick break. I'm back. I'm back. So uh, <clears throat> this is our first set of uh, th rules of thumb called the thumb rules. There's uh, six of them. Uh, the first one, 
Electricity is fundamentally charges, both positive and negative. Energy is work. Uh, there are just as many positive as negative charges in both a conductor and an insulator. In a good conductor, the electrons move easily, like liquid water. In a good insulator, the electrons are stuck in place, like frozen water, but not exactly. They don't melt. Okay. And like charges repel, and opposite charges attract. And then he goes on, now what? So now we have an idea of what insulators and conductors are and how they relate to electrons and atoms. Uh, what is this information good for and why do we care? Let's focus on these charges and see what happens when we get them to move around. First, let's get these charges to move to a place and stay there. To do this, we'll take advantage of the cool effect <coughs> that these charges have on each other, which we discussed earlier. Remember, opposite charges attract, whereas the same charges repel. There is a cool, mysterious, magical field around these charges. We call it the electrostatic field. This is the very same field that creates everything from static cling to lightning bolts. Have you ever rubbed a balloon on your head and stuck it on the wall? If so, you have seen a demonstration of an electrostatic field. If you took that a little further and waved the balloon closely over the hair on your arm, you might notice how the hairs would track the movement of the balloon. The action of rubbing the balloon caused your head to end up with a net total charge on it and the opposite charge on the balloon. Uh, the act of rubbing these materials together caused some electrons to move from one surface to the other, charging both your head and the balloon. This electrostatic field can exert a force on other things with charges. Think about it for a moment. If we could figure out a way to put some charges on one end of our conductor that would push the like charges away and in so doing cause those charges to move. Figure 0.4 shows a hypothetical device that separates these charges. I will call it an electron pump and hook it up to our copper conductor we mentioned previously. In our electron pump, when you turn the crank, one side gets a surplus of electrons, or a negative charge, and on the other side the atoms are missing, said electrons result in a positive charge. Figure, that's uh, figure 0.4, the hypothetical electron pump. If you want to carry forward the water analogy, think of this as a pump hooked up to a pipe full of water and sealed at both ends. As you turn the pump, you build up pressure in the pipe, positive pressure on one side of the pump and negative pressure on the other. In the same way, as you turn the crank, you build up charges on either side of the pump and then these charges push out into the wire and sit there because they have no place to go. If you hook up a meter to either end, you would measure a potential. Think difference in charge between the two wires. That potential is what we call voltage. Note, it is important to realize <coughs> that it is by the nature of the location of these charges that you measure a voltage. Note that I said location, not movement. Movement of these charges is what we call current. More on that later. For now, what you need to take away uh, from this discussion is that it is an accumulation of charges that we refer to as voltage. The more like charges you get in one location, the stronger the electrostatic field you create. Okay, it's later now. We find <coughs> that another <coughs> uh, we find that another very cool thing happens when we move these charges. Let's go back to our pump and stick in a light bulb on the ends of our wires as shown in figure 0 0.5. Electron pump with light bulb. Okay. Remember that opposite charges attract. When you hook the bulb <coughs> on one side, you have positive charges <coughs> on the other negative. These charges push through the light bulb and as they do, they heat up the filament and make it light up. If you stop turning the, 
if you stop turning the electron pump, this potential across the light bulb disappears and the charges stop moving. St start turning the pump and they start moving again. The movement of these charges is called current. The really cool thing that happens is that we get another invisible field that is created when these charges move. It's called the electromagnetic field. If you have ever played with a magnet and some iron filings, you have seen the effects of this field. So, to recap, if we have a bunch of charges hanging out, we call it voltage. And when we keep these charges in motion, we call that current. Some <coughs> Typical water analogies look at voltage as pressure and current as flow. These are helpful to grasp the concept, but keep in mind that a key thing with these charges and their movements is the seemingly magical fields they produce. Voltage generates an electrostatic field. It is this field repelling or attracting other charges that creates the voltage pressure in the conductor. Current or flow or movement of the charges generates a magnetic field around the conductor. It is very important to grasp these concepts to enhance your understanding of what is going on. When you get down to it, it is these fields that actually move the work or energy from one end of a circuit to another. Let's go back to our pump and light bulb for a minute as shown in figure 0 0.6. This is fi figure 0 0.6, the electromagnetic and electronic fields transmit the work from the crank to the light bulb. Hmm. Uh, turn the pump and the light bulb lights up. Stop turning and it goes out. Start turning it and it immediately lights up again. This happens even if the wires are long. We see the effect immediately. Think of the circuit as a pair of pulleys and a belt. The charges are moving around the circuit, transferring power from one location to another. See figure 0 0.7. All right, here is figure 0 0.7. The belt transmits the work from the crank to the load. Okay. Fundamentally, we can think of the concept as shown in the drawing in figure 0 0.8. A lot of drawings. So this is figure 0 0.8. The cool magical fields act like the belt transmitting what we call energy, work, or power. Even if the movement of the belt is slow, we see the effects on the pulley immediately. <coughs> At the moment the crank is turned. It is the same way with the light bulb. However, the belt is replaced by the circuit and it is ac actually the electromagnetic fields pushing charges around that transmit the work to the bulb. Without the effects of both of these fields, we couldn't move the energy input at the crank to be output of the light bulb. It just wouldn't happen. Like the belt on the pulleys, the charges move around in a loop, but the work that is being done at the crank moves out to the light bulb, where it is used up making the light shine. The charges weren't used up, current wasn't used up. They all make the loop, just like the belt in the pulley example. It is energy that is used up. Energy is work. You turning the crank is work. The light bulb takes energy to shine. In the bulb, energy is converted into heat on the filament that makes it glow so bright that you can get light. But remember, it is energy that it <coughs> sorry, but remember it is energy that it takes to make this happen. You need both voltage and current along with their associated fields to transfer energy from one point to another in an electric circuit. Thumb rules. An accumulation of charges is what we call voltage. Movement of charges is what we call current or amperage. Energy is work. In a circuit, the electromagnetic effects move energy from one point to another. 
a preview of things to come. Now all the electronic items that we're going to learn about are based on these chart chart. Ugh. Let me take let me take a quick break. Man, all this talking really drives my mouth out. Okay, a preview of things to come. Now, all the electronic items that we are going to learn about are based on these charges and their movement. We will learn about resistance, the measurement of how difficult it is to get these electrons to pop loose and move around a circuit. We will learn about a diode, a device that can block these charges from moving in one direction while letting them pass in another. We will learn about a transistor and how, using principles similar to the diode, it can switch a current flow on and off. We will learn about generators and batteries and find out they are simply different versions of the electron pump that we just talked about. We will learn about motors, resistors, lights and displays, all items that consume the power that comes from our electron pump. But just remember, it all comes back to this basic concept of charge, the fields around it when it sits there, and the fields that are created when the charges move. It just seems magical. Once you grasp the idea of charges and how the presence and movement of these charges transfer energy, the magic of electricity is somewhat lost. If you get the way these charges are similar to a belt turning a pulley, you are already further ahead in understanding than I was when I graduated from college. Whatever you do, don't let anyone tell you that you can't learn this stuff. It really isn't all that magical, but it does require you to have an imagination. You might not be able to see it, but you surely can grasp the fundamentals of how it works. So give it a try. Don't say you can't do this, because I'm sure you can. If you read this book and don't come away with a better grasp of all the things electrical and electronic, please drop me a line with, and complain about it. As long as my inbox isn't too clogged by email from all those raving reviews, I will be sure to get back to you. Thumb rules. Uh, can't is a sucker too lazy to try. Laziness is the mother of invention. Okay, fair enough. And, uh, and then it goes on. Uh, so we're just going to uh, skip ahead to the last chapter now. All right, well, here we are up the back of the book. This is the touchy-feely stuff, so it's people skills time. Let's have a quick look at this. Uh, this is the touchy-feely part of the book. Before you say ick and chuck it as far away as you can, please read on. Most average people find the people who gravitate, gravitate to the world of electrical engineering a strange lot. If it weren't true, Dilbert simply wouldn't be funny. From the point of view of the EE, the rest <coughs> of the world doesn't seem to get it. If you want to be the most successful engineer you can, there are some touchy-feely things you ought to chalk up on your list of acquired skills. Yes, it is extremely likely that these are going to be acquired skills. The engineer who comes by these capabilities naturally is a rare breed. People skills. One difficulty engineers often have in dealing with people is the fact that interactions between us human beings can't be described by slip ma slick mathematical formula like the various circuits they are working with. I personally think this is why you often see engineering groups managed by non-engineering majors. So, what should you do? One thing I have found is that Though there is no perfect equation to describe people, there are some categories into which you can sort people to help you understand how to interact with them. In any business organization, there are levels of hierarchy. There is no round table. Someone sits the head and it goes down from there. There is always a pecking order, even if it isn't on the org chart. Let's sort the personality categories into various levels of interaction since that will definitely affect how you should react. We might as well start at the top. Note that I am using masculine pronouns in these people descriptions for convenience only. Of course, all these people can be either male or female. Maybe someday we'll invent some uh, effective gender neutral pronouns. Until then, please feel free to use the pronoun that offends you the least or makes you laugh the most. Those over you. 
This means your boss, the person you report to, and the person who takes responsibility for what you do. Of course, that is in a perfect world. First, some th general rules. 1. Avoid talking smack about your boss. Even if he deserves it, constant griping and complaining will usually hunt, hurt you more than him. Maintain integrity. Sometimes lying and deception can get you ahead in the short run, but in virtually every case it will come back to haunt you. Help your boss succeed. This can be hard sometimes, especially if your boss never gives you credit. But even if that is the case, be a great employee, someone will notice. The following sections contain descriptions of some boss types. The Dilbert boss. This is the clueless boss. He has no idea what you do and he is more concerned with his position than with the success of the company. He is more than willing to sacrifice one of his employees to make himself look good. This is the type <coughs> to take credit for everything that you do right and blame you for everything that goes wrong. First, do the best you can. <coughs> Your boss's own self-interest will keep you around if you are a valuable employee. Second, look for opportunities where others in management can see your skills. This will counter the fact that your boss tries to hide you away. Transfer out of this group if you can, since it will be difficult to get far with this boss. Negotiator boss. This is the salesman type, the supreme negotiator. He will always set the goal beyond any reasonable point, figuring that somewhat how this will in get, encourage you to go further than you think you can. First, don't be discouraged by these requests. Af after that, you have two approaches you can take. Be in negotiator yourself. Overestimate the time and money it will take to get the job done so that you have room to negotiate, like Scotty does for Captain Kirk on Star Trek. The other option is to say, say what you can do and stick by your guns. Don't underestimate with the negotiator though. He will be disappointed when you don't meet the goal you said you would. The negotiator is not necessarily a bad boss to have. You could do much worse. Better to aim for the sun and miss than aim for a cow pie and hit it is the creed of this boss. Then there's the yes man boss, the micromanager, the macro manager, the perfect boss, your boss's boss, those over you summary, those at your level, the sneak, the power monger, the badger, the average Joe or Jane, the shooting star, those at your level summary, okay, and those under you, the smart slacker, the praise deprived, the dud, the average Joe or Jane, the shooting star. Finally, administrative assistance. Man, I'm not impressed by this part of the book at all, to be candid. I don't think I'm going to finish reading it. I'll jump up to the glossary and uh, <coughs> and we'll have a look at... Uh, have a look at the glossary. I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful or rude. I, I just, I, I, I don't like these stereotyping and I don't know. I, I, I didn't like that gender thing where he said that he's going to use the masculine terms and then when it came time to actually talk about the average Joe, he had to go out of his way and say, or Jane. It just rubbed me up the wrong way. I, I didn't like the language. And I, I don't think that it's so simple and, and he's being, der der he derides, you know, people that aren't engineers as being idiots and it, it's just all it just, I, it just I didn't like I didn't like what I was reading it seemed a bit off to me uh, but I, I do like the book and I, and I earlier before I came up to that final chapter I, I had actually flipped through the rest of it and had a look at it and um, and I, I, I am going to come back to this book myself and, and have a good read of all of the technical bits but I, I, I don't think there's much value uh, to be had from from reading about his uh, so-called touchy-feely uh, content. Anyway, let's have a quick flip through the glossary, and uh, and then we'll wrap it up. That'll be everything. So, one of my favourite areas in a physics book is the inside cover. Okay, it's where all the good stuff is distilled into the fundamentals. I couldn't call this book complete without creating a similar section. The following is some terms that you may or may not know. 
Words that are often used in the realm of electronics, but that typically cause a look of confusion on any non-engineer who accidentally overhears a conversation between a couple of sparkies. These words constitute a secret code, usually short to be more efficient and sometimes intended to baffle the boss or at least make him wonder what you are really talking about. They have been selected at will based on looking at my own secret decoder ring and decided what was okay to reveal without risking lynching by my own fellow engineers. AC, alternating current or current flow. AC, alternating current or current flow that switches back and forth. This is the type of power that comes in on the line to your house and is available at a common outlet. API, application programming interface. It's all layers, really. Programs talking to programs, talking to programs, and so on and so on and so on. That or it is a simple cake. Back EMF. EMF means electromotive force, which is used to describe the voltage generated when you spin the armature of a DC permanent magnet motor. The term is also used to describe the voltage generated by the connections of an inductor when you stop pushing current through it and the magnetic field collapses. Since they are both voltages caused by changing magnetic field, it makes some sense. Bias, a widely used term in electronics. Bias can refer to the voltage applied to a circuit. For example, a DC bias or offset is a way of shifting an AC signal from one level to another. Such a biasing, <coughs> such as biasing a circuit or component to a level where you get a predictable behavior. You can bias the input of a transistor, for instance. BS, come on, everyone knows what BS means. Uh, BTW, by the way, the only reason I need to define this is for old farts like me who were raised without a cell phone and text messaging. Bulk cap, a large value capacitor, usually one microfarad or bigger, commonly 100 microfarad far to 0 0.1 farads. Wow, that's big. Uh, usually an electrolytic cap, not typically good at fast frequencies, but has plenty of current capability. Uh, cap, capacitor, a plate-like uh, unit with a space of something that won't conduct electricity between the plates. A cap has the capacity to store energy in the form of an electric field. Chip, slang for IC. You will often hear engineers refer to ICs as chips. It doesn't always mean they are hungry for lunch. Current describes the movement of electrons, commonly thought of as flow. In the water analogy, this is the amount of water moving. Amp is the basic unit of current in an electrical circuit. Commonly, symbols are I and less often A. DC, direct current, or current flow that goes in only one direction. This is the type of power that comes from a battery. It is the type of power computers and most electronics use internally in their circuits. DCPM, short for Direct Current Permanent Magnet Motor. These little guys are everywhere. DMM, dam, dam meter won't measure. Dam meter won't measure. A cuss phrase often let loose when an engineer has yet to discover that the fuse is blown in his digital multimeter. Usually proceeds stalking off to the lab to find a screwdriver since you have to tear the whole meter apart just to replace the fuse. Drain. Usually this is the connection on a device that drains current from whatever is hooked it, 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 it is hooked up to drive. To drive a part means to apply current and voltage to make the part do what you want. You ha you drive a load. If asked what a thing is capable of driving, it means how much can it sink and source. Duty cycle. A percentage of on time versus off time. 
how much time the component is on duty, so to speak. If a motor has a 30% duty cycle, it means it's being used 30% of the time. The other 70% of the time, it is off. EPROM or EPROM. Uh, way back when our PROMs only had one E, you had to erase them with UV light. Oh yeah, it means erasable programmable read-only memory. Does that mean EPROMs technically were easy to sunburn? Okay. EMI, electromagnetic interference. Is anything and everything that interferes with an electro electric or electronic circuit? It is sometimes attributed to supernatural causes by superstitious engineers. <laughs> uh, Eula, everyone is unable to take legal action. Everyone is unable to take legal action. That's not what it means. If this product destroys your data, if you have never agreed to a Eula and you own this book, well, wow. I am left to a complete loss trying to come up with a quirky remark. Okay, so he's just making silly jokes there. Uh, Euler is the end user license agreement. Uh, I, I, okay, everyone is unable to take legal action. Maybe, or, or, or maybe your, your contract doesn't have any force because you try to disclaim things that you can't disclaim. Anyway, uh... He's making jokes. I, I don't know. I don't want my technical books with too many jokes. Uh, FAE, fairly astute engineer. Most uh, fairly astute engineers I have met are pretty smart, or I am just jealous that they got the easy job. I'm not really sure. Oh, yeah, it also means field application engineer. Okay. Uh, flame mail, an email that is sent with the intent to harm, not actually communicate. Flux. Flux or resin is an acid either applied separately or to the core of the solder. When heated, it cleans the joint to help the solder stick better. Forward bias refers to the biasing of a diode. When forward bias, a diode passes current. Free wheel diode. A reverse bias diode hooked up in parallel with the motor. It is there to capture the inductive current generated as the magnetic field collapses. I'm going to read that again. Free wheel diode. A reverse bias diode hooked up in parallel with the motor. It is there to capture the inductive current generated as the magnetic field collapses. Gate. This means a couple of slightly different things. A logic part, NAND gate, NOR gate, etc. Or a connection in a field effect transistor that controls the current flow from drain to source. Note that it isn't all that different from how a gate can keep or let out sheep in a coral. That is if you can compare sheep to electrons. Now there is an analogy that would be fun to explore. Okay, uh, ground and VSS, uh, the voltage reference point. Usually you connect one lead of measuring instrument to this point. It is also the place all the current returns to conventional flow again that comes from VCC. And elec in electron flow terms, it is the point that spews forth elect electrons. Okay. Um, grok, a Martian term in the book Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. It means to understand completely in the most intimate way. Ground, often used interchangeably with circuit ground. <coughs> uh, ground should uh, be thought of differently. Ground is the dirt under your feet which you drive a big stake and hook it up to the exposed metal and sometimes the ground of your circuit. This is done for safety reasons. HW, an abbreviation for hardware. IC, integrated circuit. A device that is made up of a combination of diodes and transistors and other basic parts etched into a silicon base. It's used to make things as simple as switches and as complex as the Intel pen way cooler than the last chip.
TM in your PC. Impedance, seen as a Z in many equations, think of this as resistance that takes frequency into account, used in conjunction with inductors and capacitors. Inductor, a coil of wire at its most fundamental. It can store energy in the form of a magnetic field. When a magnetic field changes, it induces current to flow in a wire. The coil concentrates the magnetic field. Iron. Soldering iron used to create solder junctions. No, you don't want to iron your shirt with this device. ISA, Intuitive Signal Analysis. The first acronym of my own invention. I figure if I ever want to be a famous engineering writer, I'd better have one or two acronyms to my name. Java, nice cup of joe, that or some programming language cool enough to be talked about at the coffee shop. Junction, the place at which two semiconductors come together. Ladder logic, a type of programming method or language. Its name comes from the ladder-like appearance of the diagram used to describe the program. Lead, oh no, that's lead. A pin on the electronic part, such as an IC, used to connect the part to the PCB. Leaky cap, an imperfect capacitor that allows some amount of DC currents to pass. Linear, a term often used in conjunction with supply or control. A linear control is one that controls voltage to a part continuously. The part controlling this will dissipate energy based on the voltage across it and the current through it. It is typically an inefficient way to drive a load since the power that is not used is turned into heat. Load, something that takes power needing both current and voltage to drive. A resistor that returns current current from VCC to ground is a load. Magic smoke, the stuff inside all ICs that makes them work. You don't want to let it out. <laughs> MAMA, management always chasing the market around. My own personal acronym. If you want to be successful in the world of engineering, you have to invent an acronym or two. Chalk up another one for me. MCU, microcontroller which is like a CPU but less powerful with more stuff built in. N-O-N-C, uh, pronounced N-O and N-C, a cryptic abbreviation for the typical state of a switch or relay connection. See, even in engineering, N-O doesn't always mean no. Okay, but he didn't even tell you. N-O is normally open and N-C is normally closed. OPM, other people's money. It's always more fun to play around with other people's money than with your own. Man, this guy should stop making jokes. OS, operating system. OTP, one time programmable. Before Flash became the memory of choice in embedded micros, one chance was all you got. There are still a few OTPs out there, but you are probably in some really high volumes if you're using these. It's likely you you are into mask parts as well. Okay. Pad. Not the place where you hang out. It's the point on a PCB of bare copper where the lead leads of a part are connected by a solder to a trace. PCB or PWB. Printed circuit board or printed wiring board. A composite material, usually stiff like a board on which a circuit is laid out, creating connections between components. PDA, pretty dumb assistant. I'd trade my PDA for a real live flesh and blood assistant any day. Okay. P programmable logic PLD, programmable logic device. Take a whole bunch of memory cells, a slew of logic gates, a bunch of multiplexes, and a way to configure it all, and then cram everything into a single IC. At the end of all of this, you get a product that can do a whole bunch of state machine and logic stuff. You can even make MCUs out of them, as in sister pro products such as the FPGA. PM for permanent magnet. Pointy hair. We have Scott Adams to think for this unique term which we can now use to refer to our bosses. Okay. P 
power the combination of voltage and current. This is what turns the lights on in your house. The unit for power is the watt. The common symbol is W. Watts can be converted to horsepower. It takes 746 watts to make one horsepower. Another symbol you might see that is loosely related to watts is VA or volt amps. The symbol is gen generally used in power supply systems to refer to AC power. It is equivalent to watts only when the current and voltage match phases. Power component. A term commonly used to refer to parts that handle a large amount of current or high voltage. Of course, the words large and high are relative. It means a current large enough so that you need to worry about things like heat and voltage and high enough so that it will do more harm than tickle if a little a little if you touch it. Okay. Power device. A common term used to refer to semiconductor devices such as uh, field effect transistors and transistors that ta that take a small low power input signal and amplify it into a high power signal. Power devices usually need to be meticulously handled in your design to avoid overheating. They often have a surface that is designed to be coupled to a heat sink to manage the power dissipated as they operate. Pull up a resistor from an input line to VCC. In the absence of any other current flow, it pulls the voltage at that node to VCC. I'm going to read that one again. Pull up a resistor from an input line to VCC. Uh, VCC, common collector. In the absence of any other current flow, it pulls the voltage at that node to VCC. Pull down a resistor from an input line to ground. In the absence of any other current flow, it pulls the voltage at that node to ground. PWM, pulse width modulation, a digital method of controlling a voltage level. The percentage of time on versus time off determines the amount of power applied to the load. R, pronounced R, is as in what is the R of that poppy? It means resistance, something that resists the flow of current proportional to the voltage. It is the R in Ohm's law. Rail, the voltage limit to which an output can swing. The top rail is the highest positive voltage it can get to, and the bottom rail is the lowest voltage it can get to. Uh, this is not necessarily the same as the power supply. Some devices cannot get the output to reach VCC or ground in the circuit. When the output at these limits, when the output is at these limits, it is common to say it is railed. Okay. RC, radio control. A fun hobby that you can dump a lot of money into. Also means resistor capacitor circuit. Rectify. Rectif rectify or rectification is the process of turning AC power into DC power. Uh, okay. Uh, reverse bias. A specific case of biasing, usually refer referring to a diode. When a diode or a diode type junction in a component is reverse bias, the diode blocks current flow. RSP, really smart person. I love to talk to really smart people. That is, when I can understand what they are saying. Sink, no, not the kitchen sink, but it does act a little like a drain. Uh, generally used in a phrase such as, how much can that sink? It means how much current is capable of going into ground through that part. Uh, SNL, Saturday Night Live. There is always something good on SNL. Okay. Solder, a material used to make electrical connections. It is heated to create the connection. Source, a term often used in phrase such as, how much can that source? It means how much current is capable of coming out of that part. Both sink and source assume conventional current flow terminology from positive to negative. 
Sparky, a widely used slang term to refer to an ele electrical engineer, at least in the world of Darren. We tried to assign the term wrench to the MEs, but it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Okay. State machine, a computing device that looks at the state of the inputs to determine the output. More complex forms of this device feedback outputs to the input and or maintain memory of certain inputs. SW, abbreviation for software. Switcher, a cousin to the linear control or supply. The switching control is digital in nature. Somewhere in the system is a switch that turns on and off, cycling power to the load. The amount of time on versus time off is called the duty cycle. It is defined as a percentage. Often there is an inductive or capacitive component in or attached to the load that filters the frequency of the switching device to smooth out the voltage or current to the load. Switch mode. The digital control of a device such as a transistor or FET, for example, the part is either turned all the way on or all the way off, like a switch, hence switch mode control. Using a device like this in applications such as a switching power supply helps make them more efficient because less heat is created when a part is not in the linear region of operation. Threshold. In electronics, a voltage level that, when crossed, changes the output state of a logic circuit from 1 to 0, or vice versa. Tinning. Refers to applying solder to the tip of an iron or to a wire to help heat transfer. Trace. The little green lines you see on a PCB. They are made of copper and are the wires that connect the parts. Trace can also refer to a method of troubleshooting software. VCC and VDD, the voltage source in the circuit. It, in conventional flow terms, it is the place all the positive holes come from. In electron flow terms, it is the place all the electrons try to get to. But he didn't say what CC and DD stand for. I believe VCC is the voltage at the common collector. So VDD might have something to do with the drain of a FET, I'm not sure. He could have been a lot clearer and have just told us instead of trying to make a joke. Anyway, I'll, I'll look up those things, why not? So we want to know uh, uh, VCC, uh, VDD. Was there anything else to check? He did say, or was it VSS was the other one, wasn't it? Yeah, VSS and ground. I'll put those in the show notes. Uh, via a hole in a PCB that on some PCBs is coated with copper. It is used for two reasons, either to create a connection between the top trace and the bottom trace, or to create a hole in which a, uh, a part lead can be inserted and soldered to the PCB. Voltage, the potential of the available electrons. Using the water analogy, this is the pressure the current is under to move. The unit for voltage is the volt. Common symbols are V and E. Voltage drop. The voltage measured across a component, such as a resistor. Not a drop in a bucket or anything like that. It's simply techno speak indicating the difference in voltage as measured from one side of a component to the other. Since what you measure is relative, you can always switch the meter leads to make it look like a drop in voltage. If a voltage drop increases or decreases, this means the absolute value or magnitude of the change in voltage across the component is increasing or decreasing. Zebra, not used anywhere in the book, but I just had to have a Z term in my glossary to be complete. Wait a minute, I should have used Zener. Or what about impedance? Now there is a sparky word that is fun to say. Try it now, see Zena three times real fast. I bet it makes you smile. Zena, Zena, Zena. Dear me. Well, now we're up to the index. I am going to go and, uh, and, and read uh, this book um, closely. And, uh, and I would certainly recommend getting a copy. Uh, but I have to say, I, I don't think I'm going to take any time to read his touchy-feely components because it, uh, it sort of rubbed me up the wrong way. Um, but 
I, uh, I definitely uh, liked a lot of what he had to say at the beginning of the book. And uh, as I flipped through it, I thought there was a lot of really good stuff in here uh, to learn about, particularly with his focus on, on getting the basics covered. So, uh, look, uh, let's, let's wrap up over here and I'll take you over to the farewell cam and we'll, we'll tie this thing off. So, that was Electrical Engineering 101. Um, I, uh, I think this is a good book. I'd certainly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's a bit late in the evening here and I, I need to get off to bed, so I, I wasn't able to spend the time that I would have liked to have spent with this book uh, just reading the, the, the bits between the, the first chapter and the, and the last chapter um, that uh, you, you'll have to get your own copy if you want to see. But... Um, I am going to pick this up again soon and, and just finish uh, reading that bit. Uh, being the rest of the book, I, 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 I didn't think that that is touchy-feely subject. Uh, I, I, I don't think that added much value to this book, and if it was me, I probably would have left that out. And some of his attempts at humour just fell a bit flat for me as well. Um, but um, there's a lot of good technical uh, stuff in here. Uh, the emphasis on, 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 on getting the basics right is something that I certainly uh, I agree with. Uh, it's what I do here. I, uh, you know, I'll go through the Maxitronic stuff and just play around with very simple, you know, resistor, capacitor, inductor circuits, and uh, uh, so I, I think I think we're in in strong agreement that that that's a, a valuable uh, thing to do. And just uh, uh, I I I liked one of the comments I saw in here about. Um, you know, it's better to know a couple of circuits inside out and backwards um, than it is to have a superficial understanding of a thousand circuits, which is similar to something that Bruce Lee said, isn't it? Which was, uh, you know, he, he fears not the man who, who, who's practiced a thousand kicks uh, a hundred times, but the man who's, you know, uh, practiced uh, one kick, you know, a hundred thousand times. So... Um, yeah, I'm glad I took the time to to, uh, to have a look at this. I made a couple of notes here um, that I'll, I'll look up and uh, and and put in the show notes. Um, I'll check out chipcenter.com, so I'll have a look at that. And MathCAD, he recommended MathCAD. I haven't heard of that before. And then I'll just tell you what VCC, VDD, and VSS actually stand for, um, which is something that he didn't do. I mean, he was too busy making uh, silly jokes to tell us what he should be telling us anyway um but look i don't want to i don't want to be too hard on him because i do think it, it's it was a good book a good uh, uh contribution to the literature um so yeah uh thanks very much for watching and please remember to hit like and subscribe